Welcome everyone to our summer 2022 speaker series. I'm Gloria Condrup, the executive director of the Hoffman Smokin Center for Typography. This series is presented by HMCT in collaboration with Art Center's graphic design department and highlights the work of four Art Center alumni. Our third speaker in this series is Hampton Dunlap, a graphic designer and visual artist specializing in branding, typography, and motion design. He has collaborated with Snapchat, Strava Apple, Butcher Shop Creative, and Decoded Advertising. He recently joined the tech unicorn Dell to lead the company's internal rebrand. His work is inspired by consumerism, cars, and contemporary art. Thank you, Hampton, for agreeing to share your work. Everyone, please welcome Hampton Dunlap. Awesome. Thank you so much. So for this presentation, uh, I'm just put together five lessons important to me that I've kind of learned both in my time, you know, working and also importantly as a student at Art Center. Um, and so I've titled this, you know, lessons in design and life from someone who is not at all qualified to give either. Sorry, Sean, for the orphan on the last page. And also, I hope this yellow is not too bright for your screens because it is the background color for every slide in this presentation. Now, I want to talk about this first part, um, not at all qualified, right? Because when I was asked to give this presentation by Alan, I had this like kind of intense feeling of imposter syndrome, right? So that brings me to my first lesson, which is embrace the imposter syndrome. And for those that don't know, imposter syndrome is defined as doubting your abilities or feeling like a fraud. Um, and this is really something that I've kind of felt at every stage of my design practice, career, life, however you want to call it. Um, from like the first time I wrote graphic designer like on my tax form under occupation, I felt I felt this imposter syndrome. Like I wasn't really a graphic designer because I started out untrained. I, I went to undergraduate at College of Charleston, studied economics and political science, and was like a self-taught designer. So I always had this feeling that like, I wasn't like a true designer, right? I was kind of like faking it to make it. Um, and whether that's, you know, starting my career, starting a new job or being asked to talk to you guys is at every stage of that, um, I've, I've really felt this strongly. And it's not really something that goes away. You, you feel it at different stages of your life, um, which is important to note then that imposter syndrome is something that everyone feels at some point. Almost every designer, artist, creative um, I've talked to feels this at some stage of their career, whether you're in school, whether you're working, whether you're just getting started. Um, it never really goes away. My, my girlfriend and partner, Gabriella, she's a celebrity wardrobe stylist for, you know, big A-list celebrities here in LA. And she had the same experience uh, in her own creative journey where you kind of start, you don't, you're not really qualified, you don't have all the answers and you're just trying to figure it out. So I'm sure a ton of people on this call feel this, you know, every day at school, when they're looking at the work of their peers, when they're seeing work on Instagram, which is uh, a big, a big, big thing, right? Seeing all this work uh, on social media that you think looks so amazing. Um, and you don't really have the full context, right? And it can make you feel like you're not worthy. But I just want every student to understand that, like, no matter who you're talking to, they've felt this. And additionally, it's important to note that imposter syndrome is a sign of growth, right? Like I said, I felt it when I first put my name on that tax form. I felt it when I got admitted to Art Center. I felt like I wasn't good enough to get in. And I felt it when they asked me to speak here. And generally, that means that you're growing, you know, you, you're becoming a, a different person, a different designer, and you're achieving different things in your career. So embrace it, you know, understand that um, that's just a symbol that you're moving up, that you're growing, that you're getting better. Um, and like I said, I felt it when I first came to Art Center. Um, I didn't think I was gonna get in. When I did get in, I thought I was gonna be the worst in the class. And that really um, inspired me to put in as much work as possible as soon as I got here. Um, so one of the first classes I took was Tracy Schiffman's um, narrative and scale class, I believe was, is what it was called, which is essentially book design. And this is the book that I created in that first semester. Um, it's titled as big as in good enough word. This was 2017. 
Trump's first year in office. Um, and I, having studied political science, you know, I was kind of like politically aware. And um, I mean, you don't have to be politically aware to know that Trump was president, but I was, you know, keenly interested in his kind of rise to power. I was just, I couldn't stand him from before he ran for president. He's just, without getting into the politics, I just think he's a total no nothing, right? And it just consumed so much of our everyday life that I wanted to make a book about something that like felt so visceral at the moment. Um, and so, as you can see, this like kind of square um, composition, it's obnoxiously large. It's 16 inches by 16 inches. And it's important to remember that this is the first book I ever made, because if I had made a book, I never would have made it this big in this way, because it was extremely difficult, unwieldy, expensive. You can barely hold it. But in a way, it's appropriate, because it's obnoxious and large and loud and bright, which is representative of the subject matter. Um, this was, I remember I was looking back at some of my work in progress sketches as I was going through this project and like halfway through nothing is formed at all. You're kind of grasping at straws, trying to get things together. And it's amazing how, if you just keep grinding and just keep doing the work and not worrying too much about the final outcome, it will all come together. And that's especially important to remember at Art Center because we have these tight, you know, 14 week deadlines from beginning of the class to the final product. And when you have like an actual made object like this, it's important to, to just like keep working at it, not get too worried, understand that like everything's gonna work itself out. And in the end, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's just a student project, but if you have faith in yourself and doing the work, it will all come together. Um, one thing to note about me and kind of my, practice and career coming in the art centers, I had worked in as a graphic designer and kind of like a traditional concept context for a hospitality and um, events company, right? So doing like kind of menus and posters and stuff like that. And then also working as a motion designer for a Snapchat um, content studio. Uh, I wasn't really qualified for either. I learned on the job, but I came in the art center with this like kind of rough, uh, rough portfolio and that kind of rough motion skills, knew absolutely nothing about print. Um, I learned about print on the job at my job before at Center where I didn't even know what bleeds were. Um, and I sent 500 client menus to press without bleeds. Um, so I can assure you that it's much more, much better to learn about print methods and stuff like that at school as a student than it is on the job on the client's dot. Um, so always remember, if you mess something up for your student project, that's all part of the learning process. That's why you're here. Don't sweat it. It's better than doing it when you're being paid to work. Now back to this project, I basically took um, these different articles about Trump before he was president. So when his life in the 70s and 80s and 90s coming up in New York, and I pulled his words out of each um, article and put them in these big pink letters throughout the book. So I think in a way they really capture not just like his kind of manner of speech, but appropriately like it overpowers the actual narrative, right? You don't really read the articles themselves. You just read his little, you know, um, sound bites as it were. So working through this project, both, you know, the motion aspect of it, which was kind of like an add on at the end, but also like the big book part, it was just a really amazing way um, not just to get to learn how to make books and to work in print, but to understand sequencing, which is of course in the name of the class. And it's something I hadn't considered before where if you look at a book over you know, the chapters, the flow of the book from page to page, it is actually related to motion design and animation, right? You're communicating messages over a span of time. It's just the format is different. And ultimately the book came together pretty successfully. I mean, in spite of my complete lack of knowledge, you know, putting this complete arbitros of a book together, um, it came out very well, something that was photographable and something that, you know, ended up being a huge talking point throughout my career at Art Center and since then, you know, I, I keep this on my portfolio. Uh, it's obviously like very poppy, very saturated, it photographs well, and people are always interested to talk about it. Um, and it's really 
fortunate that it came out this well because again I knew absolutely nothing when I first started making this book and really when I finished making it I still didn't know a ton about the book design process materials you know signatures kind of all this different stuff that you need to consider when you're designing a book but if you just like really pour yourself into the work and you know work hard and preferably work smart I wouldn't say I worked very smart on this just because again I had no idea what I was doing but if you just keep you know your nose to the grindstone and and working hard every day on your projects you can get something like this even if you don't know what you're doing that brings me to my second lesson which is you have to sell the work and this one is one i've learned somewhat recently and i think it's really important because as a designer or as a general creative i think a lot of us get into this field because we don't like to sell things um, i have a lot of friends who are in sales they're all great at their job i could never do it i can't cold call people on the phone I just hate kind of like the lying that you have to do, I think, when you're a salesman. But I've learned kind of the hard way, which is what I'm going to show in this uh, com work coming up, that you have to always sell it because good work does not speak for itself. Perhaps to us as designers, it does. You can see work and you know it's quality and you can admire it. But to clients, they don't have the same tools and the same eyes that we look at work with. Um, and in general, a client is going to go with the option that is the path of least resistance. So you have to sell your work in such a way that they can see the idea, they can see the quality of the work. Um, good work will be killed if it is not defended properly and if it is not presented in context. This is something I've learned, especially through kind of the Zoom era post-COVID, um, where you, everyone's not in a room, you have to kind of line up work such that people understand what they're looking at. Because if you just kind of like, you know, dump your exports onto a Figma page or onto a keynote and present it to people, they don't have the tools to respond to it, right? They don't know how they're supposed to critique it. And um, ultimately it won't be selected, even if it is amazing killer graphic design or typography, um, it doesn't matter if it's not set up for success. And good work is worth fighting for, because I think we all do this because we want to see something more beautiful in the world, right? Like we like to create, we like to make things that have never been made before. And you don't want to get into design or, or any creative field thinking that like, you know, your best work will never see the light of day. Um, you have to really fight for your best ideas, for your best work to be accepted by the client. So that brings me to this first project. And I'll say this is round one work from uh, a past job I'm no longer at. This has not been uh, released to the public yet. It's likely, it's definitely changed some since um, I've worked on this round one project uh, because it wasn't sold well enough and ended up being watered down a little bit. So I think what was initially like a very strong, powerful um, piece of work ended up becoming a little bit less so simply because uh, I didn't sell it well enough to the client. I didn't set it up for success. And some of the things that made it successful ended up getting cut because it was a hard decision for the client. Um, for those that don't know, which is probably everyone, I would imagine simpler is an employee internet. It's big companies use it to like deliver messages and whatnot to their employees. Um, now with this name simpler, um, obviously simple is in the name and then it's spelled in this really weird way. So it's challenging when you know, you have a project and there's like an avenue that you kind of have to take. It's like, look, the name is simpler, like you kind of either lean into it or you lean away from it, but you have to acknowledge it. Um, and we, we decided to lean into it, right? We wanted to make layouts um, and a whole design system that was as simple as possible, right? And so that's always this kind of like three up or layout divided by three with logo, image or photography, and then just black text on a white background. Now, you know, companies like Apple really own this like simple ethos. Um, so we were trying to do it in a way that uh, felt fresh within the space and not like it was just mimicking Apple. Um, and another thing I would call out too is we, because of the weird spelling of the name, we had to highlight the PPL because people would never remember how to spell this, right? It's like, I don't, it, it's such a bizarre collection of letters. So we thought, okay, well, let's highlight the weird part of the word that way we really like hone in um, on this strange spelling and emphasize what it is about, which is people. 
Um, so this first round, everything's like super stripped down to the basics, right? It's just logo type image, that's it. And really that made sense because we're trying to emphasize simplicity and we're trying to show people in the workplace, which is like where these kind of like crazy images, of, um, you know, this woman with VR glasses on stuff comes from. But the work had this, uh, frankly, like radical simplicity to it that felt appropriate for the client. Um, but it was a big jump for them, right? They were kind of a little more timid. They were a little conservative. They weren't really willing to accept work that was like this stark and reductive. And ultimately, it ended up getting watered down a little bit. Now, I think when this is released, it's still definitely a major upgrade from where they are now um, and will be a successful uh, you know, portfolio project, but it doesn't have quite the same uh, energy, I think, that we had in round one. So looking back at this in hindsight, I just always kick myself thinking, man, if we had just kind of like set this up a little bit better and explained to the client like why it had to be uncomfortable, um, right, for them to make this decision. Like a good rebrand should never really be comfortable for the client because it's something completely new, completely fresh. And they're always clinging on to something that's already kind of been working for them, you know? So selling the work to the client is half the battle, if not more in the uh, professional world. Then that brings me to lesson three, which is get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, the creative process is necessarily uncomfortable, right? Discomfort, doubt, uncertainty, that is required in the process of creating things because you're making something you know, that's never existed before. So obviously there's an extreme amount of doubt, uncertainty um, when you're trying to bring something new into the world. It's also required in your career. You're gonna to have to make hard decisions about what kind of company you wanna work for, how much you wanna make, who, what clients you want to be, who you want to work for specifically with regards to people. Um, and it never really gets easier, frankly, like you're not going to graduate from art center and all of your problems <laughs> will be solved and you'll have all the answers. You have to take the discomfort that I'm sure everyone here feels, you know, week 12 uh, of the term at art center and just get used to it. And understand that that's part of this world that we live in, right? It's part of being a designer. You have to embrace the discomfort of creating new things, of selling new ideas, of jumping to new jobs, right? And if you're able to kind of embrace that discomfort and understand that it's all part of the process, then you won't be so attached to the work. You won't um, be so worried about how people receive it, right? Like you can work a little bit more freely understanding that uh, you're always going to feel this discomfort. And not to get like, you know, too big and philosophical here, but it's part of life as well. Aside from your career, you know, do you want to move to Berlin and take that job? Or do you want to stay in LA? Like all these kind of like huge life decisions that you have to make um, will require the same things that are required by the creative process and by your career. Now, I wanted to associate this lesson, right? Um, get comfortable being uncomfortable with a project from Art Center where I was really uncomfortable the entire time I was working on it. And I think it ultimately ended up being the most successful project I had at Art Center, right? So if you are uncomfortable, and, but you're still working through it, then know that like, it's probably a good thing. If you're comfortable, then you're probably being a little too safe, frankly. Um, so the project I'm referring to is this like LA 28 project I did for, uh, for Brad's type five class. This was after I'd interned at Apple. I came back in the summer and only took this class in media texture. So that, like that was all I did that whole summer, which will be evident and like the amount of work I'm about to show, frankly. But um, the entire time I was going through this project, I never felt like I had a grasp on it. I always felt like it was too big. I never felt like it was going to resolve itself. I was worried the whole time. It's like, like, what is the end result here? Like I'm just kind of making this stuff and I'm not sure any of it's sticking or connecting. Um, so the idea for the project essentially is to brand the Los Angeles 2028 Olympics. Um, and also the Los Angeles Olympic Committee, which is like kind of the organization that is responsible for throwing the events. Um, so in a more traditional left design sense, right? We just 
I wanted to simplify this the Olympic mark here into something that's more geometrically pure. Um, and then I wanted to derive like the logo for the LA 28 Olympics from that shape, right? Those circles uh, that connect with one another and create this like somewhat abstract typographic expression of LA 28. And then as a part of that, like uh, I adapted that into an entire alphabet, right? Um, to be used for different communications and and um, and branding for for the Olympics, and then out of that, um, created the system where all of these grid lines extend down from this logo, which serves as a masthead. And then you can see that here on all these posters, right? Kind of how it works. Um, now I designed all sixteen days of scheduling event posters. Now let me tell you, like. Do not do that. It is totally unnecessary. It would have been totally fine to have like four instead of 16. And I spent way too much time typesetting and kerning like all this like six point like micro type and like crazy stuff. Totally unnecessary. I probably could have like done much more for the project if I hadn't spent so much time on all of these like crazy minute details. And like it's totally fine to get lost in the details, but you need to sometimes take a step back as a student and be like, okay, am I using my time best um, and most efficiently? Like, how should I really be allocating my time? And if you're able to like step back and assess that as a student, it will help you a ton as a creative professional as well, because that's another really big part of being a designer is making sure that you're not getting too lost in minor details um, for something that might not even end up being you know, put into production or accepted. Like you need to paint with the broad brush, get your ideas across, and then worry about all of the little tiny details. But at least now I have all 16 of these posters to show you guys. And to get a sense of like how ingrained granular I was getting with the typography, uh, we have a kind of a macro shot here. Again, this stuff is like six point with eight point letting. It's like every event, every day of the Olympics, again, totally freaking unnecessary. <laughs> do not do this, but um, it was definitely an amazing exercise in uh, like classical typography, right? And just like really working on everything from the little tiny type at six points to the big stuff up at 144 points. Um, another aspect of it, which it was this like kind of media texture component where a person would walk in front of the poster and it would uh, shine this projector on them and go through each event essentially but i do just love kind of like the overall feel of having these this little pixelated imagery on top of the printed text as if those 16 posters weren't enough they then also folded into this booklet that had a essentially a dust jacket wrapped around it with a ticket inside um which this is like kind of my favorite expression from this whole project, this like kind of combination of different materials and levels of transparency, you know, using uh, vellum and using film and, you know, printing all that on inkjet. It's just, I found in this project, especially that mixing mediums, you know, so not just working on your computer on Adobe Creative Suite, but printing stuff out, distorting it, rescanning it, um, working with materials, right at an early phase of the process i had started working with transparencies almost like week four or five or six or something um, as firstly symbolically because the olympics have had financial issues so being like okay well let's emphasize transparency that these uh, olympics are going to be run at cost so i started doing that early and that really allows you the time you need to express yourself creatively and to explore all possible avenues because if you're like up against it you can't really do the exploration with material and form um, that you can if you give yourself proper time. And then here are some of those tickets, which again, have the transparency at the top, uh, different materials pasted onto each other. Um, I would really encourage all students to like get their hands dirty and, and work with form with material as much as possible. Because I think increasingly in our profession, everything or a lot of things are digital unless you know you happen to work for a cool little firm that does books and stuff like that which are those jobs aren't as in demand as perhaps you know ui ux and motion design that kind of stuff so you know use your opportunity as an as a student to explore some of these kind of more um 
classic expressions of graphic design because they can really then inform you know how you approach it digitally and can just result in more unique work right if you're not just working in the same programs and doing the same thing as everyone else also got the chance to you know do these like libraries now these are just mock-ups um, and this is important because this kind of will come up later in the presentation when i talk about some of the stuff i'm doing now um, that's really inspiring me and that's like working at 3d and doing like texture mapping this of course is all just like kind of photoshop but it was a great introduction to this world of like designing for 3d or 2d surfaces that are put onto 3d right? it's a completely different expression than designing for the screen of course i had to put condoms because there's all these stories about how athletes go through thousands of condoms at the olympic village every every olympics now, I mentioned earlier in the project that there's also this component of like the LA Olympic Committee, and that's takes on like a slightly different visual expression than the work we had seen up till now. Um, and this specifically is 34th Olympic Games set in every language spoken in Los Angeles County, which I think was 28, but probably more, but this is what is at least listed on like uh, the LA County website, right? Um, and so this was all kind of about like diving into the history of the games of Los Angeles as an Olympic coast. This would be the third time they've had it. Uh, last one being 1984 it was also the last time the Olympics were run um, under cost, right? Which I think is really important. LA is able to support these games without, you know, using slave labor to build all these stadiums that won't be used again for 46 years. And again, emphasizing transparency, making envelopes out of vellum, right? So you can see through, it's like we have nothing to hide. Um, and just really allows you to play with kind of fun layouts where you have to account for what is, you know, contained with on, within the envelope, not just the envelope itself. And then one of my favorite parts of this was like this kind of transparency vellum book about the LA Olympic history. Um, I love just like, like I mentioned before, you know, setting typography and a book or booklet is a lot like motion design like everything is connected to what came before and after it and so then using vellum to literally see what's coming before or after it was um i thought just a really i don't know beautiful visual expression of transparency and finally had some uh, other posters emphasizing like both the historic aspect of the olympics and then also like language and all these countries coming together. Um, these were printed on vellum and uh, had this like kind of beautiful semi-transparency to it. It was really affected by light um, and created shadows beneath it. And the last thing I wanted to share from this project was basically the work in progress, right? I will, after the term, I went back and kind of scanned all of like the posters and transparencies I've referred to that I designed throughout the term. Um, and again, remembering that this entire process, like I never really felt like this was all going to come together. So like this is essentially, you know, my mind throughout the semester. This was everything that was creating. Most of it never even ended up getting used. Um, and some of the stuff that was never used, never saw the light of my day was like my absolute favorite. In fact, I want to see if I can pause on a couple of them because oops. Um, again, that's going to happen throughout both your student or career as a student and professionally is like your favorite work is probably not going to be accepted uh, because, you know, we like to push the push the ground or push the boundaries creatively in ways that clients usually aren't comfortable with. Um, as obviously I was doing here with a lot of this kind of like layered transparency and all this stuff. Um, some of these things are I like even more than the final output. Um, but I never would have gotten to where I, I, I did if I didn't go through the process of actually like making each one of these by hand. Okay, fourth lesson out of five is welcome criticism. And this is something that's I think difficult for all or most of us, and especially for me, I've never been super coachable as an athlete or really as a designer, I'm somewhat hard-headed, always kind of like trying to figure it out myself. Um, but I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to welcome criticism, both from your peers and also from potential audiences, right? 
people who aren't designers even more so, right? Because they don't see it through the lens that we as designers do. They're not looking at the typography, they're looking at the communication, right? Is it clear what you are saying? Um, and so it's important to always remember that A, criticism is inevitable, right? Any work you make compile to the work world will be criticized, whether it's like a post on Instagram or it's an entire like out of home campaign that, you know, billboards all over the city. Like people are always gonna have uh, thoughts about it that probably aren't what you wanna hear. Uh, and oftentimes it's really valid. Like we kind of get lost in our own design world. And sometimes I think forget to take a step back and think like, am I accomplishing the brief? Will people who aren't designers appreciate this and understand it? And finally, criticism that really should say will make you better. Um, because if you're able to account for that criticism and still make you know beautiful work that you're proud of, then that's like really kind of the final level of design, right? It's easy for us to make stuff that we think looks good, but other people I like, can't read. Um, but if it's legible and if it's understandable and it's well designed, then you're better as a designer and you're really accomplishing the role of the designer, which is you know to communicate to people, not just to other designers. Um, so that brings me to this project paddle, which uh, again was at this was at butcher shop um, when I was there for about past two years. Uh, they are a like payments software or for software companies. So if they want to sell their software in India, they can use Paddle and they don't have to worry about like tax compliance and stuff. Um, they were really honestly a fun or agreeable client to work with. Um, they had constructive criticism, which is frankly not <laughs> super common in my experience uh, from clients. And they really took these brand guidelines that we created and ran with them. So like, I didn't do this animation, for instance, I designed the logo and uh, did like the motion guidelines and, you know, brand guidelines and all that. But then they took the brand guidelines we gave them and their in-house team made it even better, which is like really more rewarding than making a good yourself when you make a system and someone else makes something even better out of it. That's kind of, I think, like one of the most, um, influential or impactful things we can do as designers. So this logo I drew, I mean, it's pretty basic, you know, it's geometric sans serif. I'm sure people look at it and they're like, well, whatever. I mean, I see that a million times a day and I don't disagree, but you know, with these repeating graphic forms, we might create something that was simple. And then that allowed us to really highlight that kind of P star monogram at the beginning. Um, and I'll use this also as an opportunity to plug font design with Greg Lindy. Everyone seriously take it. It's, I, I almost think it should be like required for graphic design students um, to be able to like open up the Glyphs app and design your own type, even if it looks like this, which is like essentially Futura, right? Like to be able to do that for every project is really valuable, hard skill to have professionally. Um, on most of the projects I work on, I ended up drawing the logos in Glyphs. It's so much better than Illustrator. And it really allows you to, you know, create a mark that's not just some typeface that's like, you know, shittily customized in Illustrator. Like learn font design, even if you're not gonna be a font designer, it is a crucial tool, I think, for uh, the modern designer. Then a lot of those same, you know, concepts we took from the word mark, we put into the, to the little star icon that goes into the P. Um, probably the best part of this project was stuff I didn't do, which is <laughs> these illustrations. So of course, you know, we provide art direction around the illustrations and give them guidance on what they should look like doing swipe or pulling swipe from, uh, you know, different illustrators on the web. Um, but they kind of took the guidelines we gave them and really ran with them. Um, and I think the end result is really powerful. These kind of cool, like vapor wave, uh, future. Uh, illustrations was something really interesting for the space that they're in and was just really fun to see again them take the guidelines we gave them and blow them out into something even better than we had accomplished this of course is all part of the system this was this was our work that we provided to them and you can kind of see where they took it from here there's this whole concept around like um uh basically like space uh cadets right it's like kind of this weird um strategic concept, but it ended up being a really fun system to go out there and create. And then here's some of like that, here's some of the out of home that we ended up producing. And it's a very simple, 
like graphic system, but uh, has just this kind of vibrancy that I think um, ultimately was really successful in the end. And it's, you know, some of these projects are so challenging. You spend so much time on them that by the end, you just want to get it out and be done with it. But this was like kind of one of the ones that it was a joy to work on all the way through. And back to the lesson, which is welcome criticism. After this whole project, which, you know, considered a big success, uh, we were able to get it on the brand new, which was a big goal for me professionally, because we had never, as a studio, had never had work on brand new. And it was a goal I'd set with my creative director to get one of our projects on there. Of course, it goes up. And then the first comment is small nitpicky thing. The kerning on these badges reads as PA space D space D space L space E. And <laughs> such a gut punch to spend months working on this project. And like this little tiny badge has like one thing that's current wrong. And like, that's the first thing people comment on. So <laughs> understand that that doesn't mean the work's not successful. He's right. The padding or the kerning is shitty there. I wish I'd caught it, but it's just tough. You can't always get to every kerning pair when you're working on this entire brand project. Um, and so, you know, take that criticism and get better from it. You know, hopefully I'll have fewer of these little kerning errors going forward. And then the last lesson is never stop learning. And I think this is probably the most important lesson to take away from here. Um, it's something that like, I carry with me every day, uh, right? And since I've graduated from Art Center, I have not at all lost the urge to continue to better myself and to continue learning and get more skills. Um, because if you're like always a student, you will always be improving as a designer. And it's really frankly a privilege that we can work in an industry where like you can keep doing it and keep getting better, you know, essentially until you die, right? Like there's no end point, right? I have a lot of friends who are working towards retirement. They just have a career, they wanna get past it, but like, or you can't work past a certain age, but like, we as designers can really be students our entire lives. And I think that that is kind of the most powerful thing about being a designer to me, right? Is this path of self-improvement and betterment and understanding that the work can always be better. And so as an example of that, I wanna share like some of these renders that I've been doing in my free time um, the past couple of months. Uh, I mentioned at the top, right? I'm a big car guy. I'm obsessed with cars and motorcycles and stuff. Um, and I was always really intrigued by these renders that were done by this artist, Ash Thorpe um, on Instagram, where they're so realistic. I didn't realize they were renders. I thought they were photos at first and he would do these like kind of modified cars. And when I found out that they were renders done in 3D programs, I instantly was like, okay, like I, I have to learn how to do that. Um, and I had, you know, a little bit of experience with Cinema 4D. It was like a constant labor of love. I did really steep learning curve. I never was super comfortable in it. Um, but through like trying to emulate his work and I still have a long way to go, I've gotten so much better at the program and associated things like render engines like Arnold and Redshift and stuff. But um, this is really like, I can't tell you how rewarding it was for me to like render this and see just how good it looked in the end. It still can be so much better, but like a year or two ago when I saw these on Instagram, or on the web, I never would have had any idea how to create them. And to, you know, continue to like work at it and constantly get better, you know, on weeknights, weekends, not saying don't have a social life, seriously, please do, but always continue improving your ability and the skills that you learn from, you know, things like this, which are just for me, can be translated into your career and into your work as well. Um, so this is something I'm continually trying to improve at and get better at. Um, you know, I kind of like this aspect of like almost Barbara Kruger style, like, um, you know, messaging on the cars is like this like kind of object of uh, commercial appeal. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I'm kind of aware of like my commercialism and empty consumerism when I am obsessed with cars, but like, I like using that as like a canvas of sorts, right? Like some of the BMW art cars of the past like 40 years or some of my favorite expressions of art and design. It's like um, this combination of, of consumerism and of, and of fine art is a, just a really interesting space to me. And so to be able to do these renders in cinema, I, for reference, I use Cinema 4D and Redshift to make these and then using Substance Painter to create the, um, the texture mapping that goes onto them. 
so yeah, I, I would always just encourage you, you know, I'm not saying you have to learn 3D or you have to learn these hard skills in your free time, but like continue to pursue what inspires you creatively outside of work, because you're not always going to have the chance uh, professionally to do work that really inspires you, but you will always have the chance to do it in your own time. And if you do spend time doing that and you do put effort into it, not only will you get better as a designer and creative, but it might open other professional opportunities for you that you never could have imagined. And with that, I am finished. Oh, thank you, Hampton. That was wonderful. I always wanted to see your work. And unfortunately, the term I came in was the term you graduated, and it was right before COVID. It's really an honor to see all your stuff. Amazing. Thank, thank you. you. I, really, I, I really appreciate. I just wanted to say, like, hearing that from, from students, um, that means that really does mean a lot to me. That's not bullshit. Uh, when they, when y'all asked me to speak, I was like, really me, I, you know, we had like Brian Collins and Eric Koo and, you know, Yuma last week and all these amazing Paula share, like all these amazing designers. I felt such like, why would anyone want to listen to me speak? Um, but the fact that, you know, uh, you had those kind of things to say about me when you were coming as a student, like that really does mean a lot to me. And, um, I'm, I'm very flattered that y'all would ask me to speak. So, uh, honors or us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, now we'll open up the stage to any questions. So anyone feel free to type in the chat. I'll read it to Hampton or I'll mute the mics. Yeah, really great work, Hampton. I mean, it's just amazing. And it's to see the body of it is it's it's remarkable. I mean, how extensive it is and how much research and strategy you put into all of this. Um, and so there's nothing that's not considered which is um, so beautiful. What would you say, Ed, what did we not teach you well enough? Like what should we have done better at when to get, when the, to get you out in the world? So it's a tricky question because I think like in terms of going into the industry, Art Center really does like the best job of making sure you have the hard skills necessary and the work ethic necessary to succeed in the creative field, right? Um, like I think there's a common understanding among professionals when they're hiring it's like oh he went to arts and like or he or she gets it you know like they will have like a certain baseline of understanding of work ethic that like you will be successful okay so like no one worry and think like you're going to go to a job and like not going to be able to hack it like, y'all are better than 99 percent of the designers out there already um the one thing i wish in hindsight that i had done more as a student um is just like like get crazy like i know i already <laughs> I kind of have a reputation as like really getting crazy with some of the work um, and not holding back. Um, but like really exploring just creativity, not just graphic design, right? And I think that that's almost like, like almost approaching it as a fine art in a sense. Um, I think would have been creatively fulfilling for me in hindsight as a student, you know, without kind of professional obligations to do some of that. So that's what I would encourage students is like, you know, really push the envelope. Like, don't worry about looking buttoned up. Like, make sure, yeah, like your typography is all locked in and everything's like done well, of course. Uh, and I'm not saying like just flaunt the rules, even if you don't know them. Like, you have to understand the rules to break them, but like really push the envelope. Um, I think is what like I'd love to do even more. And I think classes that like really help you do that are ones that aren't graphic design classes. So like one of my favorite classes I ever took was screen printing with uh, Anthony Zapata. And it's not a graphic design course, it's a fine arts course, but like it, you know, gets you, you learn how screen printing works. You learn how lithography works, woodcut printing, like all this stuff. And it makes you work with your hands. And it just gets you in a completely different world than like doing, you know, brand identities and stuff, which is a little more uh, professional. So I would say like, um, you know, really push your creative boundaries, right? And challenge um, certain common precepts of design. And one thing I'll say is like, every teacher here, like y'all seriously listen to your teachers. They are fucking rock stars and they're taking time out of their busy professional schedules to uh, impart knowledge and they all know what they're talking about but like also if you're going to challenge them make sure that you have a reason why like don't do it just to do it like um, so I would say like if you are able to find you know kind of rationale reasoning for like really pushing the creative boundaries that's 
what I wish I had done even more as a student. Sorry, that was kind of a long winded answer that didn't totally answer your question, but it felt appropriate. Next, we have a question from Shane. How, do, how does your economics and political background help your design work? Um, that's a good question. Um, first of all, I feel lucky every day to get to do this as a profession because like I look down the barrel of like a career in finance and just ran the other way, right? So I almost like went down to that alternate reality of like working in something I didn't give a shit about. Uh, so I think that kind of gives me a certain level of like acceptance and happiness with the work, even if it's not as good as I want it to be. Um, just that I get to do this every day is is truly a blessing. And then I do think when it comes like, to the business aspect of design. Um, I think a lot of designers are somewhat timid. They don't value themselves enough, right? So you go into negotiations with like a, not just a client or a potential employer and you, a lot of, you know, people, designers are very inward and they don't want to, like I'm saying, they don't want to sell the work. You know, you don't want to sell yourself, right? You just like, look at my portfolio that should speak for itself. But like, I think having that kind of economics background and kind of business school background makes me a little more comfortable in like negotiations and being willing to say no um, and demanding, you know, a certain rate, like not just working for less because like you don't value yourself enough. Um, so I would say that for sure. And that's hard to just teach or it's hard to just do. It's something you kind of have to really get out of your comfort zone uh, to do, but designers should value themselves more, their time, their abilities. Y'all are spending a lot of time and money to be an art center. Um, and you, you know, you should understand that. Like y'all are the best of the best and don't go into, you know, interviews or negotiations, you know, not thinking enough of yourself. So I would say certainly kind of like that aspect of like knowing the worth of my time and my skills. Like these are things that, big companies, little companies really value and need, and you should be paid as such. And speaking of knowing yourself and understanding your worth, how do you get past and go over imposter syndrome? I, like I said, I don't think it's something you ever get over. You know, you, it's something you have to embrace and accept, right? Because then it will fuel you to get better, right? If you think you don't belong, then you're gonna work harder to prove that you do belong. Um, sure. So don't think that it's something that like, oh, I won't feel that. Like you will always feel that at stages of growth in your career. So if you, you know, become senior designer and you're responsible for juniors, you will probably feel imposter syndrome. Like I shouldn't be telling this person what to do. Or if you become an art director, or creative director, if you're invited to speak at art center, right? All these things that like, you don't think, and this ties back into valuing yourself, right? But like, um, if you don't think that you're supposed to be there, then you will work even harder to prove that you are. So just accept the imposter syndrome and use it to your advantage rather than trying to avoid it. Uh, well, so it's, it's more of a, a term for growth rather than fear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think we have, we, it's just much, it's also like very common. I think probably the most successful people in the world feel it, right? So if you're feeling it, it's probably a good thing, what I should say. Okay. And next we have a question from Kenny. How do you know when your initial concepts or sketches are worth expanding and iterating on? That's a tough one. <laughs> I've definitely gotten into trouble professionally where I get attached to this idea and I know there's something there and I can't let it go. Like I've had to have creative directors like be like, stop, like you have to stop <laughs> and move on to something else, which is always a battle. I don't know, you know, I think, there's never a way of truly knowing. I do think like if it's flowing, right? If you had this idea and like work's just coming out, that's generally a good sign. Like, okay, this is worth exploring. Cause like, if you have like, oh, this is the greatest idea ever. And then you're just stuck there and you can't output anything. You can't draw anything. Like that might be a sign that the idea is not as good as maybe you think it is, right? Like, so it's one of those things where you can definitely go down a rabbit hole too far. Um, but generally, like, if the idea is good, then the work will come, right? So I would say that that's, that's probably the best sign. Nice. And seeing you have so much experience in different type of field, uh, design fields, like in-house or corporal, where do you see yourself as a designer in 10 years? 
uh, in 10 years, I hope I'm not a designer. I hope I'm an artist. <laughs> That's not to say I don't, I, I do want to design, right? Like I would love, like, I think my biggest inspirations are like, you know, like Virgil Abloh or someone like that, who is like such a polymath that like, he's a fucking killer designer. He's also a fine artist, right? So like, I don't want to necessarily be like working for a studio in 10 years. I would love to have like my own art and design practice um, where I do both, you know, fine art commissions and then also design, right? Um, I think we kind of get in and it's like such human nature to like want to narrowly define things and be like, I'm a typographer, type designer, or I'm a UI UX designer. Like I'm kind of just like, I, I want it all. I want to experience it all, um, which makes it hard to like put a label on it. But yeah, I would love to like have my own private practice and work as both an artist and a designer on select commissions, essentially. Awesome. And now we have a question from Jamal. How do you have, how would you have thought for your simpler rebrand idea if you could go back in time and how would you have made them more comfortable with the new ideas oh well that's the hard part right <laughs> like actually figuring out how to sell it um i think making certain concessions um to make the client more comfortable so like what i was saying is i think some of the work lost a certain amount of like it's uh uh Complicity, a certain amount of like it's ethos, I guess ethos for lack of a better word. Um, but if you make certain small concessions without sacrificing like the overall idea, that can be a way to like kind of ease some of the client's pain, but also retain the um, the the it, the thing that makes the. I'm gonna brief aside. Simon has said one of my favorite things I've ever heard a teacher or a person say, and I think of it all the time, is consider the thingness of the thing, right? And he was like saying that with regards to a book, like what makes a book a book? Um, but that's like applicable to like every design project, right? So like simpler, like what was the thingness of the thing? It was this like kind of, you know, radical simplicity, illustration style, photography style, strict typographic style. And so I think if I'd been like, okay, well we can like massage the logo a bit, but we need to keep the photography, illustration, typography style, then that might have eased the client while also allowing me to retain the thingness of the thing, right? Like what made that round one successful? Oh, the fine balance. Yeah. Yeah. So any last questions for Hampton? So we're running short on time. I have a question. Go for it, Joe. Um, yeah, so when you're looking at the student work, so you already like touch based on like doing this experimentation, you know, having set yourself uncomfortable and also like clear communication. Is there any other thing that when you're looking at student work, like you particularly look for? So, you know, certain, I think like visual work in general and specific, you know, especially design, there's always kind of like a, you know, when you see it type of thing and it can be a million you know it can just be like it can be the layout it can be the typography color choice like there's a million different things that can draw you to work i think specifically with art center because it's an insular design community right it's students who are all in pasadena together they're all taking the same classes talking to each other learning together and we're often looking at the same sources of inspiration quote unquote, right? Like we're all like kind of on the same Instagram channels and the same work is being echoed throughout those channels as is being an art center, right? So I think a certain style can manifest, right? Where people are using similar type choices, um, you know, similar techniques, what have you. So I think often if I'm like in a student gallery, what I look for is like something that stands out as different because I think it's one thing to have very well executed work that's another thing to have very unique creative work, right? Um, and that's not to say the first is bad. Like I think getting to a baseline level of execution and, and confidence is necessary for every student. But like when something stands out as different at Art Center, that's like, like wow, that person's really um, doing the right thing, right? Like they they're not just competent at an art center scale, which is like the highest scale, they're also thinking creatively and uniquely, which is more challenging because again, like I said, we all have common points of inspiration and education. So I don't know if that really answered your question. It's it's hard to put your you, you know your finger on it. But generally, you know, work that just feels different and like you're not 
using all the same resources as everyone else, um, I think is really the most like, kind of like um, lasting work, the stuff that really stays with you. All right, yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. Of course. Before I ask my last question, Sean, anything, any last words? No, I mean, it's like, so it's a great work and thank you Hampton for such a great presentation. And thank you so much for reinforcing that we actually know what we're doing. That's always <laughs> nice. <laughs> People yeah, tend to not believe that's what they actually leave. Then they're like, oh, you exactly. actually did know what you were talking about. <laughs> and now maybe like, I don't know why I, I always had like a reverence for my teachers. I think in general, just like listen to your elders. <laughs> it's like totally so rote, you know, but like these people, your teachers, Sean, the department, like they know what the hell they're doing. They've been around the block. They've been doing this shit 40 years, you know, 20 years, 10 years, a long time, basically. So that doesn't mean, you know, their word is gospel, but listen to them. They're really talented, like best in the industry kind of stuff. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Cause well, like, th thank such, you. I mean, we make an amazing too, though, Believe me, yeah. we're allowed. We're, of course. We're, there are times when <laughs> sometimes a student is right and we're wrong. So that, that works too. <laughs> Definitely. But thank but, uh, you so much for coming and giving us your time today. Yeah, thank, thank you, you again for, for having me. And um, thanks everyone for, for listening, for paying attention. I, I really appreciate it. And hope to be back on campus at some point and see some Yeah, we'd work. love to have you. Uh, sure, before we close off Hampton, in one sentence, how would you define graphic design? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, there's gonna be an awkward pause here because like I have to sit and think about that for at least like 20 seconds. And you know, I, I was lucky enough to take a class with Lou Danziger. For those who don't know him, look him up. He taught at Art Center forever. He was like peers with like Alvin Lustig and Saul Bass and like Design Hall of Fame people. Um, I believe he defined it as visual problem solving. Um, and I think that's probably the most apt succinct description I've heard. Um, so whether that's using type or image or both, right? You're solving a problem or communicating a message visually. Um, that's probably the most reductive definition of graphic design I could think of. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, everyone. Back inspire us. Best of luck at the end of the term. And um, thanks again. Oh, sure.